Um, well, I always say when I'm talking to uh, young aspiring writers who are asking me or friends that are trying to get into it, uh, I really feel strongly that there are writers and then there are people who write. And uh, if you're a writer, you're just going to write. You're going to always write. I write when I'm bored. I write when I'm scared. I don't write, you know, I don't have to think about writing and sit down and, oh, I'm going to have to write. It's, it's what I do when I'm not doing anything else. Uh, and then there are people who just write and they'll, they're writing because they want to try to sell a movie or they're writing to sell a book. If it doesn't work out, they maybe give up on it. So I feel like I've always been a writer. It's just something that I've done my whole life, the way someone might play guitar or whistle or play sports. It's just what I do. Yeah, it was around, uh, I, I worked in Hollywood and went to film school at USC and was lucky enough to have a few moderate successes out here. But I never really liked LA very much and uh, I knew at some point I'd want to leave. And when the Writers Guild strike happened, I was one of the people that was really devastated by that. My roommate was laid off from Sony, it was a really hard time and I decided it was time to go. And uh, I had to figure out something new to do and I decided to, you know, I wanted to write a book about something, I just didn't know what. And I realized that Nickelodeon is something that I grew up with I could be passionate about, I could invest a lot of my time and energy and frankly money into. And uh, no one had really done it yet before, at least not for a mainstream audience, so I decided I wanted to do that. That was probably 2008, 2009, but I didn't really know how to go about doing it until a few years later and a friend of, a friend of mine hooked me up with Jim Jenkins. He was my first real interview for this book. And uh, I did the interview, I had no idea what to do with it. I kind of let it sit for a few months. And then uh, suddenly I decided it was time to take it seriously, the Nick all that. Uh, 90s were all that started happening on Nickelodeon, the Pete Pete reunions were starting up and I realized I better start doing this before someone else does and luckily I had an agent from a previous project, she specializes in this stuff and we were able to sell it pretty quickly actually. There was a collective forehead slap when we were talking to all the editors and publishers, it was like why hasn't someone done this yet, of course, so it was really great. No, I, I, the, it's a weird catch-22, and I have a few other friends that are doing this kind of material, or, you know, creative nonfiction is very, very difficult these days, especially if you're like myself and you don't have any real connections, and I mean, I never really talked with anybody at Nickelodeon or anything, I had no one I knew there, um, so it is important to show the publisher that you have a way to get to these people and that you can actually make this happen because, you know, you need an advance to do a book like this. I had to work on this pretty full time and uh, they're gonna give you some money. They need to make sure you're not just some crackpot who's like, well, I wanna do this. I had to prove to them that I'd already talked to a lot of these people. I already had done some of the interviews. Uh, I was actually doing a weekly um, article on a different Nickelodeon show where I talked to a lot of these different people for a website called Splitsider. I'm kind of ambivalent about writing for websites, but in this case, it seemed to help because I was able to show the publishers, hey, look, I'm already doing this. Why don't you come along for the ride? I mean, just that. I mean, it was yeah. really, really hard to track everyone down. As I said, nothing like this had really ever been done before. I've described it before as it was like uh, doing a million piece puzzle without having a picture. I mean, I didn't even know who exactly to talk to for every show. A lot of these people aren't even credited on IMDb. And, you know, I was really going through all these different kinds of articles and whatnot. And so a lot of stuff is incorrect. And it, a lot of people kind of did different things at different shows. Um, so it was very difficult just to figure out who to talk to, to track them down. There were a lot of people where everyone said, you're never going to get him. I mean, Roger Price, the creator of You Can't Do That on Television, has more or less become a recluse in south of France. I don't even remember how I tracked him down, to be perfectly <laughs> honest. You know, John Chris Falusi is very well known for dodging the press. There was a young man, Thad Pomeriski, I believe his last name is pronounced, who did a Ren and Stimpy book. He wasn't able to get John. Uh, we were able to get him for this book, luckily. So. Um, it was a very, very tough process just to track everyone down, to schedule those interviews, to do them, and to learn the story of Nickelodeon while I was doing it. So a lot of people I had to call two or three times, and everyone was very generous. I ended up talking to about 250 people. Again, that's hard to say just because, as I said, it was sort of a fragmented process to actually get there. Um, I'll leave it at when we signed with Penguin, they gave us six months to do it. Originally, they gave us three, and I begged for six. So the, the bulk of it was done over a six-month period. Yeah, originally, I was really influenced when I first thought about doing the book back in 2008. I wanted to do it very much like a hero of mine, Michael Azarak, who did an amazing Nirvana biography, and also just a fantastic book that I've read numerous times. And I was reading while I was doing this book called Our Band Could Be Your Life about the kind of 80s underground bands. And I wanted to do it more like that. Every chapter would be a different show, 
almost more like a Tom Wolfe type of creative nonfiction thing. But, um, you know, oral histories were starting to become all the rage. I personally like oral histories, and I thought that could be a really interesting way of doing this so that it's their story, they're telling the tale. <clears throat> and I just knew I wanted to do it a little bit differently. Rather than doing it necessarily chronologically, although the book is still pretty much chronological, I decided it'd be interesting to sort of deconstruct Nick and sort of break it down into different chapters that dealt with the different elements that made Nick special, its diversity, its design, the kids who were there who were some of the first kids to really be in shows like this. And it, there's still a semblance of chronological. It starts somewhat in the beginning and ends with, you know, the end of this era. But I want to do something really special. And some people like that. Some people have been a little confused by it. But ultimately, I think that it really worked. Luckily, um, I am also a filmmaker, especially a documentary filmmaker. And I know how to sort of edit people's quotes and their ideas together and it's really important for me to find those bridge ins, bridge outs. Um, I think a lot of people who've been reading this book have been very happy how smoothly it runs. It really is a full narrative and you can really go from kind of quote to quote to quote because it just tells a sort of seamless story, uh, especially some of the chapters like where I'm talking about what happened over at Ren and Stimpy with John Chris Lucy getting fired. It really is just boom, boom, boom. And that was very, very, very difficult to accomplish. But again, I treated it like I was editing a documentary. I mean, I get asked that question a lot, and the thing that, that surprised me the most is a pretty general thing, which is just how much information there was, and how incredibly elaborate and circuitous the journey of Nickelodeon was. I mean, it just, there's so much there. Um, the original book that I turned in was 270,000 words. The book that you're buying in stores is 90,000. I think it's better that we made it shorter and more accessible, a little bit more fun. You could, you know, read it in two hours, really get the story of Nick there. But there's so much information out there. There's so much I learned about it. Hopefully we'll be able to get some of that other material out and ancillary products and what have you. But um, I was just so incredibly in awe of how, how just elaborate that story is. You know, I mean, it really could be a film. We've had you know, some inquiries and that kind of thing. They're making the MTV movie now. I mean, there is enough there, I think, for a movie for sure. You know, it's the same lesson that we've learned with a lot of these great nascent art movements, music movements, what happened with Saturday Night Live, what happened with MTV. You know, you start off with this small thing, you don't have a lot of money, you don't have a lot of people watching over you, it's just a couple people, you know, having some fun, trying to do something a little different, entertaining themselves. Slowly but surely, other people start getting involved, start noticing what's happening, a little bit more money gets involved, a little bit more of the bureaucratic side, and suddenly before you know it, you know, you're out in the atmosphere and your audience becomes less yourselves and, you know, the people you're trying to entertain and more your bosses, you're trying to keep your job, you're not taking as many risks, you know, there's a lot more out there, there's a lot more people involved who aren't even watching the shows or looking at the artwork or whatever it might be, they're just looking right at the numbers and decisions start getting made that might be better monetarily, it might be better as far as expanding the brand but not necessarily for the product that's being created. And, you know, it's a shame. But I think I do do a good job in the book of being objective about that and showing, you know, with people like Albie Hecht and Herb Scannell, who are really uh, very largely responsible for expanding Nickelodeon's brand and creating so much with Nick, they just took it in a different direction. And that in itself is also impressive and um, something that's a, its own talent. You know, they were able to make it international. They were able to do all this stuff with merchandising. That's a pretty hard thing to do too. And that's its own little thing. So I'm glad that they, you know, were able to talk about that in the book as well. Um, I'm a little bit surprised how incredibly intentional everything was and how meticulous they were with really figuring out exactly how they wanted their audience to be affected by this. Um, I think that they're a little bit surprised that we have arisen, and now that we're in our 20s and 30s and are the arbiters of what gets through in magazines and videos and all these kinds of things, how much we've been affected by it. Uh, when I talked with Catherine Diekman, who was one of the creators and directors on The Adventures of Pete and Pete, she's a film professor at Columbia now, very good film school, and she could tell when people are influenced by her material. and. Um, I think they're a little bit surprised by the lessons that we learned or did not learn, but um, they ultimately wanted us to have a sense of, you know, that anti-establishmentarianism, 
and questioning authority, figuring things out about reverence, um, but still having a respect for the past with the kind of doo-wop music that they were using for a lot of the animated bumpers, which is also very intentional. I mean, they were talking to psychologists. They wanted to make sure they weren't screwing up people's kids. So, um, you know, just the fact that they really knew what they were doing and figuring all these little elements out was very smart and kind of getting that little backstory about which colors they used and why and, you know, what slime might mean symbolically and that kind of thing was its own kind of fascinating, you know, element in the book, I think. Favorite uh, live action is definitely Pete and Pete. Uh, it was just completely singular. I mean, it's a show. There are a few people that I know and they're aware of the book and they've been talking with me about it and they'll say, you know, Matt, truthfully, I didn't grow up on Nickelodeon. I didn't watch those shows and whatnot. And inevitably, Pete and Pete comes up a lot because there's been so much, you know, with the reunions and whatnot. And I say, you know, that's one you really should actually watch. Like, get it on DVD. I love a lot of the other shows, Sleep Your Shorts and Clarissa. And, you know, those shows are great, too. But Pete and Pete's doing something kind of special with the music and the special guests they had on there. Animation, definitely Ren and Stimpy. You know, I love Doug, too. Rugrats, I was a little bit more uh, ambivalent about when I was younger. Uh, I have a lot more respect for it now, knowing what all, everything they did to, to make that happen. Um, but definitely Ren and Stimpy. I mean, I had two Ren and Stimpy shirts growing up, a black one and a white one. I had a Ren and Stimpy birthday party. And even now, you know, when you look back on Ren and Stimpy, I mean, it's just laugh out loud, funny beautiful animation, voices are great. Billy West is, you know, probably one of the greatest voice actors of all time. Uh, and, you know, it's just an incredible show. And then for game shows, you know, obviously Double Dares, Numero Uno, of course. Ah, that's a really good question. I always really like the, the egg, you know, when the egg, you're trying to get the eggs in the, the, your helmet, because that just, that's one that kind of, it's like when you did the claw thing at Chuck E. Cheese or whatever, you were trying to get the stuffed animal. Egg one, for some reason, always seemed the easiest to me, and I was always sort of surprised when they weren't able to do it, and I just felt like that's something that I could do. I always want to sort of jump into the screen and be like, no, move a little. So, yeah, I was sort of like that one. I've never been slimed. Gosh, wow. Uh, not really. I'm kind of a clean person. I'm a little anal. My, my roommates have always been a little bit upset at how much I'm the guy who's like, clean your dishes, etc. So, um, I probably, I mean, I guess I want to do it just to see what it's like. And I talked with a lot of people about what is it like to be slime, what does it taste like, what does it smell like. Um, so, uh, you know, maybe for curiosity's sake. But we'd have to go back to the Roger Price days of real slime and uh, see what that would be like. Definitely Mark Summers. Um, you know, Mark has been great this entire time. He's really been pushing the book. Um, he's been so supportive of everything we're doing. Uh, you know, at this point, he should be getting a part of the royalties, frankly. I mean, he just is a big, big part of our team. Um, and he had so much to say about Nickelodeon. I mean, anytime someone would say, oh, I can't tell you that, or I don't know that, I would go, okay. And then I'd call up Mark and be like, hey, Mark, uh, I need to know this. And he'd say, sure. And then, you know, he'd tell me. And, so that was great. Um, and then Billy West is somebody that I think was really fascinating to talk to. I, he's another person where, like Nick itself, I had no idea that he had such a vast and protean background where he was doing so many different things with punk bands and Howard Stern and just everything that he's done in his life. I've actually been talking with him a little bit about, you know, if there's one person that I would like to maybe do, you know, a project on just on him, you know, like a documentary or a book or something, it would be Billy West because my God, he's gone through so much in his life and he has all these wild theories about art and culture and consumerism in this country. I mean, he could just talk and talk and talk on that even more than I do when I ramble. So, um, you know, Billy West was something that was really cool um, to get to be involved in talking with him. And uh, again, certainly I was a big fan of Ren and Stimpy and a big fan of Doug, so that was kind of neat. I've been wondering a lot about, you know, if this was even a good idea at all. I think what makes a lot of this special, a lot of these shows special, is that you can't get them on DVD, a lot of them, and that you can't find a lot of them even on YouTube, at least not in a quality that you can really watch them and hear them. I think one of the things that makes a lot of these shows and this era of television or Nickelodeon special is that it is ephemeral, uh, and that, you know, it was, it, it was like one of our childhood memories, that it's, it's gone now. All you can do is remember it, talk about it, and try to deconstruct it and think about it. I'm wondering very much if I did something really wrong and kind of pulling it back out from this, you know, it, it was resting in peace. Um, you know, I'm reading some John Cage uh, lectures right now, and he said something really interesting, which is as soon as something's finished, it's exactly that. You have to revitalize it. 
So I think maybe rather than resurrecting these shows, we should be taking what we learned from them now that we're all in our 20s and 30s and making movies and books and things and making something completely different, doing something that's very much our own, but, you know, coming from that world. You know, the other side of that story, though, and the more political, diplomatic one, is uh, the connection that we all get. The fact that I'm talking to you right now, that there's people downstairs waiting to hear me talk, that we were able to fill an auditorium with 900 screaming people uh, in New York, you know, a couple nights ago, who were all there, and, you know, many of them becoming friends or were already friends because of these shared memories that we had. And uh, I think that that's really important, too, so the community of it. Not to mention, these were amazing shows, and I think something that a lot of the people making TV and movies today should go back to, at least in a lesson in aesthetics and, you know, how to write, you know, the scripts and whatnot. So as lessons in the way it can work, where you can bring together art and commercialism, art and, you know, children's playfulness, uh, I think is really important, too.